keep apologizing for myself. Okay. All right. We are really getting close to the meat of my book here. We really are. I promise. We're getting. I mean, I promise you. Like in another life chapter or two, I'm never going to apologize to you again. Okay. I'm going to try. Okay. So. Okay, here we go. There's a lot of new people in here today, so dare I say it again? Yeah. Yes, my fictionalized memoir, Don't Jump, is um, chronicles a woman's quest to find her place and purpose amid sex, drugs, rock and roll, and celebrity. This installment takes place in New York in 1990 and find, finds Andy, a 30-something, single, up-and-coming rock and roll promoter dating two guys. Mm -hmm. on the same day. <laughs> They're writing partners. <laughs> One was her comedy teacher and got her started on her rock career by accident. Then he introduced her to her childhood best friend, also by accident. Now she's dating both of them on purpose. <laughs> Poor. <laughs> Those were the days. Okay. Once Lenny left on his cruise, Barry had the upper hand and decided to make the most of it and truly torture me. He invited me back to our old neighborhood to wander around and reminisce. We walked the two blocks from the subway station to my old house in the Bronx. The knee-level windows looked so small. A basement apartment, my memories of it were as dark as my old bedroom now was. Cookie worked long hours. A latchkey kid, I came home alone to an empty house. My father and brother lived across the street, the before mentioned Larry. But it was far from, I, this is, I made this up. It's not, um, but this was far from an ideal life for an 11 year old. I didn't like the feelings that were surfacing. Barry, sensing my discomfort, led the way back to the street towards his old house. We wandered into his backyard and warm memories began to take hold. Passing Francine's place, the name on the door still read Mancuso. On a lark, we decided to ring the bell. Her mother answered the door looking much the same as she did 20 years prior. We, of course, did not. Mm -hmm. And she pleasantly inquired as to who the hell we were. <laughs> Once we explained, she insisted we come in for some tea. After catching us up on Francine and her family, she asked, do you have children? Looking at each other, we burst out laughing, explaining our recent reunion. How romantic. It's destiny, no? One would think so. Mm -hmm. Barry and I smiled at each other. He seemed to forget for a moment how angry he still was at me over the 4th of July, and of course, over Lenny. After lingering for a few moments, we left a note for Francine and a promise to return. Heading down the once familiar Lydig Avenue, we both were struck by the change in sights, smells, and sounds. What was once predominantly a Jewish neighborhood was now almost exclusively not. <laughs> Very few remnants of our youth remained. Thankfully, Gloria's was one. I had to have it. The price was certainly not as I remembered. What was once a 15 cent slice of pie was a dollar fifty. And I don't know why that shocked me. It was the going rate all over. Mm -hmm. The young man making the pizza, no longer the son of an Italian immigrant owner, was now a paid by the hour Latino. The pizza, uniquely once delectable, was now lukewarm and pedestrian. Offering Barry a bite, I said wistfully, they say you can never go home again, and I guess they're right. Mm -hmm. Barry chewed contemplatively and added, you know why you can't go home? They changed the locks. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed, grateful for the levity in this moment of utter disillusionment. Carbell was two doors down, the local hangout for my brother Jeff and his friends, where I tried desperately for years to fit in. Barry got a cone and offered me a lick. Even the ice cream was not as I remembered it. Feeling sorry for myself, I dropped my half-eaten slice in the garbage can on the corner and ran right smack into a woman who looked vaguely familiar. Have you lived here long, I asked. All my life, she replied, smiling. Uh -huh. Do I know you? I think you know my brother, Jeff Schwartz. Knew him? I blew him! <laughs> She heartily laughed at her own joke. <laughs> Just kidding. How's Jeff? <laughs> Bringing her up to speed, I promised to say hello for her, only she never did tell me her name. There was something oddly comforting in it, nonetheless. Barry went to the payphone on the corner to call his dad to arrange pickup spot where we were going to join him and his second wife for dinner. 
In an instant, he was screaming at him, turning blue, embarrassed for him, embarrassed for me being with him. Mm -hmm. It was too reminiscent of too many maniacs I'd spent my life with. It was scary. Surely Lenny never did that. Extremely agitated, Barry motioned for me to join him on the corner. Too afraid not to, I complied sheepishly. I was terrified he'd turn his wrath on me. My stomach flipped. We walked silently toward the rendezvous point on White Plains Road. I can't believe it. TJ Music's still here, I said, taking, the break, taking it to break the ice with genuine enthusiasm. I wonder if the Madnik's still own it. Let's go in. Hooking my arm in his, I started walking towards the store. I was yanked back a step by Barry's unyielding stance. We've got to meet my father. We have a few minutes. Come on. Barry grudgingly followed, looking like an eight-year-old being forced to ingest a teaspoon of castor oil. Behind the counter, a tall, tanned, handsome guy with a fresh pump was reading the newspaper. Danny, is that you? His eyes began at waist level, slowly working their way up to mine. <coughs> Woof! Woof! Oh, sorry. It's okay. Sorry. Nothing. Squinting for a second, as if to better the focus, there was silence, slow recognition, and then a smile. Andy? Andy Schwartz? Holy shit, get over here! We embraced over the counter. You remember Barry Schoenbaum? Yeah, yeah, sure, he said, shaking his hand without taking his eyes off me. You look incredible. No wonder I had a crush on you. Mm. Crush on me? I had a crush on you! <laughs> he said, if only I would, I would have known, this could have been us. And he showed me a picture of his wife and kids. <laughs> <laughs> They're beautiful. Can't say I've been as lucky. Divorced. No kids. How oh, me. Having had enough of this, Barry loudly cleared his throat. <laughs> well, people really do that? <laughs> well, this is great, but we've got to run, Barry said, pulling me towards the door. Great to see you, Danny. You too, Andy. Don't make it another 20 years. When I got outside, I was furious. That was incredibly rude. Do you know everyone in the Bronx, he sneered. What's with you? What changed your mood? Nothing. I'm fine. Good, I said sarcastically. <laughs> Good, he smirked back. <laughs> Within a minute or two, Stan and Stella Schoenbaum, Barry's dad and stepmom, showed up at the corner of White Plains Road and Pelham Parkway as arranged. We hopped in the car, doing the introductions as Stan pulled away. He looked just the same, and I told him so. He was quite pleased with that, mm -hmm. not knowing that he'd always looked old to me. <laughs> <laughs> All parents <did. laughs> So, do you kids have a good time, Stan asked good-naturedly. You gonna call me a kid when I'm 50? Barry, give him a break, I pleaded. Don't tell me how to talk to my father. <laughs> Be nice, Stan said, embarrassed. Turning on the radio, within a few seconds, Stan was singing along to Mac the Knife, mm -hmm. as was Stella, followed by Barry. I couldn't decide what was worse, the fight or the fun. As we arrived on Arthur Avenue, I settled into an old familiar calm. Back in the day, all New York Jews knew, Saturday night's Italian, Sunday's Chinese. It was sacrosanct. Arthur Avenue is to Italian food as Bourbon Street is to gumbo. The smells immediately took me back. There's something about the foods of youth that remain, never forgotten, forever craved. I must have been about four when I had my first slice of pizza on 161st Street across from Yankee Stadium. It was sitting on a piece of white wax paper, the cheese oozing off the crust sticking to it. It smelled like fresh baked dough, tomatoes and oregano, and tasted like chewy heaven, the mozzarella stretching a foot burning the roof of my mouth. Remember that? Mm -hmm. A few blocks away was Hebrew National, with the best garlicky hot dogs coated mm -hmm. with spicy brown mustard and hot yellow sauerkraut that made the roll soggy with its juice, <laughs> and whose taste lingered for hours as it repeated. <laughs> <laughs> and the huge crunchy egg rolls with finely shredded cabbage, bis bits of roast pork, and whole tiny shrimp from House of Wong. They were to die for. I've chased those flavors just as I did my first high never accomplishing either. But this Arthur Avenue baked ziti was as close to Crossways in Fallsburg, and that's saying a lot. It saved the day. <laughs> on Saturday morning, I awoke excited and hopeful. It was to be my first time on a cruise ship. I was missing Lenny and wanting him. 
After shaving my legs, perfuming from head to toe, and putting on my best undies, I called Marianne to get permission.